engineering for reducing emissions, reducing energy usage, and improving energy efficiency in general. So Professor Kemmer's history is particularly innovative in a way that he has a very nice combination of industrial experience and academic experience. He's leading many research projects in Europe with a total of more than 100 million euros in general. Wow, that's a large number. And he has produced many PhD students, tons of collaborators who are taking faculty positions all over the world, in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, well, not many in the US yet, but hopefully soon. And he has published many, many papers, getting a lot of citations and many awards. I would like to particularly know that he has also received six honorary doctoral degrees from Europe and from Asia. So that's certainly a big uh, collection of honors and recognitions. In the meantime, he's an editor and editor board member for over 20 journals. I don't know how you can manage to have time to handle all his manuscripts and submissions. In any way, I'm not going to take, take up too much time, so please join me to give him a very warm welcome. Okay. Uh, well, good morning. It's still morning because I haven't got a lunch. And uh, I'm very happy to be here. It's for the second time. And, uh, you know, the, the place, university, is marvelous. Just the airport is a little bit tricky. Uh, last time I arrived at uh, 3.30 in the morning, and this time uh, 14 hours late. So I already know the place, and I'm scheduling my arrival one day earlier to arrive just on time. Uh, well, what I'm going to talk, uh, uh, the first, uh, you know, in the EU, we've got very strict policy of uh, uh, having everything 50% male and female. So I've got 50% of my authorship uh, female. Uh, she's a very bright uh, now graduate. Uh, she managed a PhD with less than two years. and. Uh, also contributed a lot to the research. Well, as an int introduction to myself, I was born in the country which doesn't exist anymore. It uh, was called Czechoslovakia. And uh, it split it into two, but uh, we are not fighting nation. We are very peaceful people. Uh, there are some jokes if uh, the Czech army should win the war, we should make our enemies drunken and steal their weapons. <laughs> and um, it works like this, more or less. But uh, uh, during the Second World War, the most successful fighter pilot in the uh, Royal Air Force was actually Czech, the person who shut down the majority of German planes. But uh, he had to fly in Polish squadron. Why? because he was always flying after a little bit of uh, uh, special drink. <laughs> anyway, so uh, my life uh, uh, route went from uh, Czechoslovakia to the industry. I spent 20 years in the industry, built, uh, or better say, to start up and commissioned a number of plants. Most of them are destroyed now. Why? Because where is oil and gas, it's always a military conflict. Basra, Homs, uh, this part of the Ukraine, it's uh, not so much about human rights. It's very much about oil and gas. Uh, so I moved to academia, went to Edinburgh, which is uh, one of the most beautiful cities in the world, at least in summer. But after I got uh, invitation which I couldn't uh, refuse. It was UMIS, the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. And that time, uh, outstanding laboratory about process integration led by Bodo Linhoff. And uh, when I reach retirement age, I've got Marie Curie Grant, Chair of Excellence, went to Hungary. And uh, after, I've got another big grant uh, uh, at the moment, 5 million euros and return after 50 years to my alma mater, to my own university. And I've got already another grant, 1 million euro for Sino Czech project with uh, Gio Tong, uh, Xi'an, and Sinopec. And uh, so I built uh, this group. Uh, this is for Chinese New Year. And uh, you can see it's uh, fairly international. 
and it has also the number of collaborators. And uh, those collaborators are not just visiting each other and having good time, which all, of course we would like to have, but about joint publications and joint projects. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> this is the Sino-Czech project. Uh, again, it works very well. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of university we are collaborating with and uh, uh, it's uh, coming from uh, very different countries. Uh, I very much like, for example, Philippines. Uh, before I consider Philippines as a small island, but it has got nearly 120 million people. Can you imagine? The it's not small country on the, the map of universe it is. And uh, as uh, is was already said, this is my one of my babies, Journal of Cleaner Production. Uh, the baby is now 27 years old, which is young lady in the best years, uh, but unfortunately or fortunately growing too much. Uh, can you guess how many papers we received last year? How many do you think? Any guess? A thousand. Okay, good. Any other? 22,000. 22,000. So it's a huge journal and baby, you know, growing. But I'm happy it's successful. It still has got good impact factor. So I'm not persuading you to submit paper. I should say don't. But uh, uh, we are always happy with good papers. And uh, this is multidisciplinary journal and uh, covering the number number of issues which are most of them are very hot nowadays. So to the talk, I will start about circular economy. Why? Because when we made statistic of uh, most cited papers in general of cleaner production, first 10 places were about circular economy. Well, you might agree or not, but uh, this is what is now a real buzzword. And, uh, uh, you know, I would like to make a little bit balanced uh, uh, overview of circular economy. Uh, it has got strong market drivers. It can be a win-win situation, create value. Uh, well, it can contribute to risk management, environmental efficiency, innovation, brand image. Those are all pluses. But it's not as simple as nothing is simple in the world and in the engineering especially. This is one of the pictures we <coughs> which uh, has been published. Uh, everything looks rosy, but if you go down, uh, well, you need energy and you still create waste. Not all the waste can be circled, circled in uh, new raw materials. Actually, we can circulate a lot, but what would be the cost? Uh, it's not wise and uh, you can't sell it to the companies, say, to save energy at any cost, to circulate at any cost. It has to be viable, financially viable. And uh, what are the challenges? We've got thermodynamic limits. Uh, well, we always need uh, energy. Where the energy is coming, and uh, all energy on this planet is coming from the sun, but uh, energy is downgraded. Entropy, exergy, you know, uh, we are always coming from a high level of temperature to the lower level of temperature. Uh, we've got uh, system boundary limits and uh, circular economy is sometimes shifting the problems around the circle. And uh, uh, we can't shift it uh, forever. And there are some, some bad issues uh, with circularity. Uh, we already discussed, uh, for example, one related to heavy metals. We've got uh, in our food chain, we've got very, very low, uh, still permitted by legal limits, few ppm of uh, uh, heavy metals. But if we circle 10 times, you know, this is accumulating. So in, uh, in the EU, we now are not allowed to use sludge 
from wastewater treatment plants as fertilizer for the fields. Because it looked okay, but 20 times multiplying it become dangerous. So it's one issue which is demonstrating the problem. Uh, limits posed by physical scale economy. <coughs> I don't know how much you know about the rebound effect, the Jeevan's paradox, boomerang effect. Uh, it's uh, very much about psychology. But a simple example is if I design the car which has got the fuel consumption 50%. Do you think that we will we would save 50% of fuel? No. Why? It's about psychology. It's this uh, uh, Jeevan's paradox. Because if it's cheaper, I will use the car more. And sometimes it can finish that actually the fuel consumption is more than previous 100%. Because fuel is so cheap, so I don't care and I, I drive more, more, more. So there are many, many physical issues. I've been in Manchester at a part of uh, a Tyndall Center for Research in uh, a Climate Change. Uh, Mr. Tyndall was uh, the Scottish scientist who first uh, realized uh, the greenhouse gas effect. But he is not in the center because he lived 200 years ago. But when I came there, I was very much surprised because half of researchers were from sociology, psychology, and others. You know, and I, as a core engineer, I said, what those people can tell us. But they can, because we as engineers are able to design very efficient hardware, very efficient building, very efficient industry, cars, everything. But we need to persuade people to use it. And this is a different story. So. Uh, there are many limits, and uh, there are also limits of governance and management, and the limits of social culture definitions. In different countries, we've got different culture. You know, if you are, say, in India, you mustn't touch the cow. If you are in Europe, uh, some people are, well, not eating pork. Some people are loving pork. Some people so. Uh, it's variety of nations, and we have to deal with them. So uh, this is the relation between uh, environment, waste to energy, and circular economy system. And uh, <coughs> many things are actually related to waste, waste treatment, and waste management. In circular economy, it shouldn't be anything like waste, but unfortunately, it is. And uh, when I was in Manchester, do you know what was uh, the biggest business in Greater Manchester. The biggest business wasn't IBM. It wasn't Rolls Royce. It was Greater Management, uh, Greater Manchester Waste Management Authority. Because this eight million people are creating enormous amount of waste. And it's growing. And this is again psychology problem. Because if we would like to be sustainable, we shouldn't get everything packed, you know, in uh, 10 boxes, plastics, everything. But okay, this is the culture. So uh, this is one of the pictures which uh, we created, uh, circular issues of uh, 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 circular econ critical issues of circular economy. Uh, what we suggest that the circularity shouldn't be this big round, but it should be as small as possible. Not to go around, but reuse, recycle as early as possible. Because if we are going around the cycle, what? It requires logistics, it requires uh, resources, and it actually creates more waste. So this is about circular economy, and now we are coming to emissions, which is the main part what we are doing. Well, everybody is talking about it. Uh, uh, we've got greenhouse gases, and uh, unfortunately, all those graphs are not looking very nice. Politicians are talking. You know, the Swedish girl is talking, which uh, I think she should uh, rather 
demonstrate on Saturday and Sunday and go to the school, but this is my old-fashioned uh, uh, opinion. But uh, we have to do something. Uh, what do you think about greenhouse gases? If it has got big influence or lower influence, it's escalating. And it will escalate. It will escalate more and more. Why? Because uh, the number of people on this planet is growing. And uh, it's not only China, India. Uh, it's assumed that India has got more people than China nowadays, but who knows? And what is happening? More people need more food. Well, they are breathing as well, some CO2. But uh, when the level is growing up, everybody would like to have car, everybody would like to have air conditioning, everybody would like to get house, and it's a big amount of resources. There are some theories that this planet is not able to survive more than 10 billion people. Who knows? But uh, forecasts are that the critical situation will be about the year 2050. Unfortunately, I am not going to be alive at 2050, but most of you, uh, yes. But uh, do you know what will happen? Africa. Africa population is at the moment kept down by diseases and bad living conditions. But it's improving. And there are countries like Nigeria, which I know, you know, a booming population, 150 million. And all of them will again need the resources. <coughs> so, uh, well known the carbon emission cycles. I am a little bit touchy when somebody is using terminology carbonless society decarbonizing, because this is nonsense. This is for media. Because if we would like to decarbonize this room, everybody should provide 12% of the body, because 12% of our body is C. Well, but most of uh, chairs and everything would disappear because it contains C. So it's about carbon emissions. And uh, as you can see, uh, the CO2 is not just industry. It's uh, also, and I've been shocked I moved my research uh, now quite a lot to agriculture and forestry. And EU forests are actually generating more CO, well, more greenhouse gases, because it's not just CO2, but methane and others, than they are capturing. So what green? You know, because those forests are not managed to capture CO2, they are managed as industry producing wood. And this is very bad. So we have to consider all issues. And uh, what we can do if we would like to contribute, real contribute, waste energy. Waste energy is a big problem. Uh, this is uh, uh, some uh, graph showing uh, where the energy goes, industry, transport, others. But uh, well. This is shocking picture, U.S. balance. Uh, on the left-hand side, you've got input. Uh, look for renewables. No, no, not too much. But the red conversion losses. And this is official picture from a very credible source in the U.S. U.S. is the most advanced economy and Losses of energy are 66 percent, two thirds. And uh, the countries which are not so advanced have got much more. So what I'm saying, you know, I'm not a politician, but where should go research funding? To renewables? Yes. But mainly to conversion losses, to losses of energy. Because if we reduced it by 20 percent, we don't need so much coal. And the problem is close to be solved. Uh, well, global waste heat. It's a lot of waste heat, uh, mainly low potential heat. The heat, uh, uh, I've been making consultation to many oil refineries. And the first questions I always received tell us what we should do with low potential steam. 
steam, which is uh, 105 uh, degrees centigrade. Well, it's a lot. What we can do with this? We can use it for heating the town, but no town would like to be close to the refinery because the refinery is dangerous animal, smelly animal. So uh, nobody would like to leave uh, 400 meters from the refinery. Well, we should do something with this. Uh, energy consumption, uh, thermal processes in the UK are the most demanding. And uh, most of this goes again to low potential heat. So if you want to make some very meaningful research in circular economy, try to find what to do with low potential heat, because there are possible savings. <coughs> Circularity indicator, again, it's measured by different ways. But why I put this slide, look on this gray, how much it generates waste. And uh, if we are talking about circularity, still, you know, recovered flows are very thin. Waste are very strong. And uh, now I would like to uh, use a few slides about uh, waste, about uh, plastics, polymer, racing, synthesis, fibers, additives. This is uh, the topic which receives uh, now a lot of attention. Why? Well, those are pictures which are well known, but uh, are you aware that the most dangerous plastic, or, well, dangerous, it's strong picture, because uh, so far no uh, medical capacity said it's really dangerous, but it can be are not plastics, but microplastics. You know, very small article, particles. And where we are generating it. If I wash the clothes, microplastics are coming out. If I shave myself, microplastics. If you use makeup, microplastics. Uh, many things, but also tires, car tires. Uh, they are creating a lot, lot of microplastics which goes with rainwater to the seas. So uh, uh, the problem is more complicated. Now, one funny question. Plastic versus paper cup. What is more environmentally friendly? Many, many producers now are saying uh, we are moving from plastics to papers. So we use the uh, the balance from the Royal Society, UK Royal Society of Chemistry, and found this. Paper cup is producing much more emissions, requires much more energy than plastics. Well, what is the best solution? I'm always telling students, don't look on this, look outside the box. And uh, this is what uh, I've got several meetings in the morning and I very much appreciate the professor who came with his own cup. You know, traditional cup from ceramic, brought it, use it, yes, and I really praise you because this is, the, yeah, this is, this is the solution. Because if it's plastics or paper, we just use it once and throw it out. So this is not sustainable and we shouldn't be, uh, this is another example, we shouldn't be dragged in to improve things, we should think out of the box. Straws for drinking, plastic, paper, wheat, steel, glass, what is better? No straw at all, because we can just drink it and uh, you know the McDonald's they started to use uh, paper from coffee and said, uh, you know, this is uh, much more environmentally friendly and sustainable. But uh, they had to stop because it uh, doesn't survive to drink the full cup of coffee. It <laughs> melted and you've got half. So, uh, you know, if you are doing research, there are two options. To try to improve something traditional or to think out of the box. Simple 
solution. And the third example, uh, I attended a couple of conferences and uh, conferences are usually providing you a pen. And uh, I met uh, uh, an uncut and asked a couple of uh, well-known professors which pen is more environmentally friendly. The top one is bamboo. This is from recycled paper. But both have plastics and those are some answers. You know, very complicated. Uh, going for bamboo and plastics and what, what are. But what is the best answer? No pen. Why conference should give the pen? Because everybody of us has got pen and uh, many of pens. So the, don't look uh, which one is more environmentally friendly. No pen is the solution. And it is a minimum footprint. So this is an example how to think and how I'm teaching students. And uh, in many cases, it's quite uh, successful because they, they are thinking for new ideas and sometimes very simple ideas. Uh, environmental footprints. Footprint is something what uh, is, uh, it appeared at the year 2008 and uh, one of my students made the review for Journal of Cleaner Production in uh, 2012 and is still one of the most cited papers. Uh, it's uh, an example, if you would like to make a highly cited paper, you have to pick up something which has got a huge potential impact. If you are improving reactor, uh, can be a very nice piece of chemical engineering. Uh, you may write very nice paper to chemical engineering science, <coughs> but uh, around the world is not more than 200 people who are really interested. If you write about footprints, especially at the beginning, uh, it has got now uh, more than 600 citations because uh, chemical engineers, mechanical, <laughs> electrical engineers, you know, everybody is interested. So uh, this is about, uh, it's a number of footprints and uh, it went to a very funny situation, you know, about uh, uh, 2015, everybody wanted to create new footprint. So we calculated about more than 200. Uh, sociology, financial footprints, wealth footprints, health footprints. Okay, but uh, uh, too many is too many. This is probably uh, the solution of those more most popular. Of course, carbon footprints are most popular in the uh, media, but uh, as I said, carbon footprint is nonsense. It should be carbon emissions footprint, but better greenhouse gases footprint. Why? Because in greenhouse gases, CO2 is less than two thirds. And we've got methane, we've got anoxys, and we've got VOCs and others. And methane is nearly 22 fold stronger than CO2. And where is coming methane? Well, a little bit from industry, but mainly from agriculture. And if you've got wetland or polluted river, anaerobic digestion, it creates a lot. It also comes from uh, agriculture animals. This is uh, <laughs> what is my favorite saying. Uh, I'm asking people, do you know which country has got the, is the most polluted country by greenhouse gases per inhabitant? And everybody is in China, US. But per person, it's New Zealand. <laughs> They've got 4.5 million people and 160 million cows and sheep. And the cow, what is doing the cow? Breathing, but also creating manure. And manure comes anaerobic digestion and methane. So I said, uh, if you want to reduce greenhouse gases, you need to put all cows into boxes and collect the manure immediately, put it in anaerobic uh, uh, digestion reactor, and you will get a lot of methane, but animal, animal levels would kill me.
because everybody would like free range uh, X and, and so on. And this is again sociology. You know, we should balance. We should balance greenhouse gases, animal lovers, free range uh, X, uh, free, free range milk, and we have to decide what we want because it's no simple solution. It's always a trade-off. So, uh, definition of carbon emission footprint is like this. Uh, there are some other definitions, but uh, uh, this is probably the most uh, uh, used. Uh, I just picked up, because I haven't got time, a couple of slides. Greenhouse got footprint of biomass. Well, biomass is no way zero emissions. It has got emissions. And it uh, can be very different. And biomass has got one big problem. When we are burning it, we are releasing anoxys. Because everything what is green is full of nitrogen, full of anoxys. So uh, if you've got a boiler using biomass, it's about this size. And three times more is uh, of gas cleaning of anoxys. It's possible, it's possible to clean, but you need energy, you need capital, and most people are not doing it. Just uh, <coughs> you can see what is happening in Australia. Forest fires, which are releasing enormous amount of pollution. Actually, Australia, those forest fires created much more pollution than the whole US. And it's biomass, so it's zero emission. But it's not zero emission. Emissions are everywhere and sometimes very unpleasant. So uh, we can also use uh, footprints for so-called eco cost and eco benefit when you can increase this or re improve it. But we've got also water footprint. And water, there are forecasts that again within 20 years, most uh, military conflicts will not be about uh, gas, oil, and coal, but about water. And uh, people need water and need more and more water. And uh, uh, this was developed by people from uh, uh, around Ariel Hextra from Delft universities. And it's quite clever. The problem with water footprints, uh, it's not the same water. He made the classification blue, green, and gray water. And uh, unfortunately, we are taking blue, green, and creating this gray. But it's not really great in many cases. It can be very, very colorful. But the more colorful, the worse. OK, so it's about water footprint. Nitrogen footprint. And again, nitrogen is a very tricky thing. Anoxys are greenhouse gas, but they are also responsible for many bad things. And as you can see, it's industry, but there are animals, there are fertilizers, and all are related to nitrogen footprint. And this is what the nitrogen is responsible for. You know, respiratory diseases. Anoxys are actually one of very important parts of haze. If you look on big cities and the haze, anoxys are a very important part of it. And uh, some health problems and so on. Now, uh, how it is with uh, greenhouse gases emissions? Uh, should we consider countries by Emitting? Definitely not. We should consider who is guilty by consuming. Because uh, look on this big flows of virtual uh, uh, greenhouse gases emissions to the EU and to the US. Because if we buy mobile phone, if we buy the computer which is made in China, footprints had to be released there. And we are clean and we are just consuming. But uh, this is not the major issue. Fertilizers. Fertilizers are the most energy demanding 
and most polluting, and China is making 90% of fertilizers. And uh, uh, again, this is my uh, uh, favorite saying. I came to Ludwigshafen to BASF, huge uh, German chemical company. By name, by German name, it was about uh, paints and fertilizers, and say, where is your fertilizer plant? Well, they've got big hole because uh, about 50 years ago, fertilizers are very tricky. Because if uh, you are a terrorist and would you like to blow something, you just buy a, a buck of fertilizer. And with 50 kilo, uh, kilograms of fertilizer, you can blow up this building very easily. And mm, next one. But uh, OK, they've got big hole because it was a huge explosion. But they just decommissioned the plant and pushed it outside the EU, and saying, we are clean. We are not making. So you should consider this virtual flows. And there are virtual flows of other footprints, even water footprints. Well, uh, this is something uh, different. Japan. Japan is considered to be quite clean, but as you can see, it's not the case. And uh, Japan made a little bit hysterical reaction after Fukushima. And you can see what happened. They, are, they stopped this yellow nuclear power plants and what released gas and other polluting sources of energy. So this is not really the best solution. Well, Fukushima was bad, but how many people were killed at Fukushima? I don't know about any. Some maybe, maybe some. But uh, close to it was oil refinery, and there 56 people died, and media nothing. So I am not supportive of nuclear energy, but if we like it or not, we can't leave at the moment. Uh, well, wind power. Wind power, people are saying zero emissions. But you know, to build this wind turbine, you can see the size compared with Airbus 380. It requires a lot of material. And what do you need to get it on foundation? And the foundation for such a mast should be very solid. And it requires 100 of cubic meters of concrete. And concrete. <coughs> <coughs> has to be produced and it creates footprints and uh, it's uh, not like the mast which uh, is actually not having uh, a lot of uh, vectors of power you know this wind turbine the wind is going from all different sides but it's not all now the US will have more than 720,000 tons of uh, blade material because the blade has got a lifespan maximum 15 years. And it's made from Kevlar. So it's not easy to cut it on the spot. You need to take it, uh, you need to bring it somewhere to a specialized uh, manufacturing plant and to do something with this. So those are examples. We made the table uh, of batteries, of photovoltaics, of wind turbine. Uh, what you need to do uh, what is about recycling, reuse alternative, and challenges. And this should be done for all so-called renewable sources of energy. Because as English are saying, it's no free lunch. Everything should be paid. And uh, there are some other, I've seen some very nice lecture from the Beijing Normal University about building wind turbines. If you need to build something on a hill, you need to make the road and big road in the mountain. And it's actually used just twice, commissioning and decommissioning, but uh, it makes a big impact of the ecosystem because the road should be for such a big uh, turbine about 30 meters wide and it takes uh, the layer out and it starts erosion. So there are many problems. Now, smoke haze. As I said, uh, 
are S oxys, N oxys, V O C, and particulate matters. And PMs are very bad. Uh, well, this is what you can see in many big cities. And uh, what uh, we should do? Of course, we should reduce the amount of fossil fuels, definitely. But other sources, you know, VOCs, anoxys, and especially PMs. And we made monitoring of uh, a city. It's uh, a very interesting uh, uh, now development uh, about street canyons. If you've got a big building, it's like a valley. And uh, what is happening? The circulation of uh, uh, the air is uh, somehow influenced. And it can be good or bad. But uh, if you are measuring uh, cars, stopping on the red light, it's not only emissions. Tires, again, small PM. Acceleration, again. And PM10 are looking bad. If you've got uh, something white, PM would make you dirt. But PM below 1, it actually is not settling on our lungs. It goes through our lungs to the stream blood and causes a lot of different cancers. And what to do with this? You know, Dili, this is now the city which is uh, really, really f uh, in trouble. And uh, Beijing is doing uh, big uh, issues to reduce it, but Dili not. And it is going what is going to happen with many big cities in developing countries. And uh, results are worldwide ambient air pollution contributes to more than 5% of all deaths. So what, what is more important, demonstration about greenhouse gases or this pollution? I personally think this is really what is killing people now. Increasing the temperatures, it can kill people within 30, 40 years. But this is killing people now. And we should do something. And you can see you've got a lot of different contaminants. And uh, you can't escape uh, at your home. You know, British are saying, my house, my castle. But the castle can be pretty polluted. And it's sometimes question if it's better to stay inside or go outside. And uh, the more modern things we've got, the more pollution. So what to do? Some people are buying uh, air purifiers, which is a nice thing. But our lungs are not getting enough trained for situation when we are going out. If we decide to live in the room where air is clean, fine. But uh, uh, it, is, it is the problem with uh, very clean environment. It was found that children who are living in two clean houses got a lot of eczema. They sometimes need to, to be exposed to a little bit of dirt. This is the same. Contaminants in the ambient air. Again, you can see we've got plenty of different sources. It uh, is very nice. Uh, uh, application, you can get it in your mobile uh, API, Air Pollutant in Index, and you can see different places around the world, and sometimes you are surprised. You wouldn't say those cities are uh, really so much exposed. There are actually a number of uh, ap applications uh, about the different pollutions, and it's good to use it. Sources of contaminations, uh, there are many. I uh, wouldn't read it through. You can, you can find it in uh, uh, EPA, uh, US Environmental Protection Agency website, which is very credible. And the final part is uh, <coughs> about smart cities and uh, inf Internet of Things. This is a well-known model. Smart environment, smart people, smart living. Everything is smart. Great. Uh, well, uh, do you know what is the most difficult? Most difficult are smart people. 
because other things you can somehow manufacture and assemble. Smart people so far are difficult to be manufactured. They can be only educated. And I am saying as a professor, I'm trying to educate my students to be smart people. And uh, I hope when they graduate, they will have again their own students. And you know, this pyramid should go and change. But it's too slow because people are many. And uh, to be smart requires uh, the change of the philosophy. You know, that I don't need uh, several cars. I don't need a house with uh, 10 rooms. I don't need to use air conditioning when the temperature is uh, 26, which is happening. And uh, I shouldn't waste food. Wasting food is uh, a very bad environmental crime. And if we manage to reduce wasting the food, the most problem with emissions would be solved. I've got official figure from Tesco, UK supermarket, and they made the research and 60% of food sold by Tesco supermarket is wasted. And if you transform it into emissions, effluence, everything, you know, if we just behave slightly different, uh, we wouldn't need so uh, many measures and uh, reductions and laws. We should just behave. And uh, so uh, I'm telling my students when we go to the canteen uh, for lunch, you should take uh, only so much as you can eat. And when you put it on the plate, you should eat it. And I loved uh, the message in one Chinese hotel for breakfast. You, you know, it, it was uh, free range. You, you could take what you want. But it was written here. Please eat and drink as much as you want. But what you leave on your plate will be weighted and you are going to be charged three times more for this. <laughs> and it should be done everywhere. You know, it's not democratic, but uh, uh, either we should feel like this, not only if we say about sustainability and whatever, we should behave like this. So to Internet of Things, again, uh, options are enormous. We can do a lot, and I personally believe in one thing, what can solve the problem with uh, uh, mobility, with transport in big cities. The only way are autonomous shared cars. You know, uh, as, as I'm calling for a taxi to take application, say in 20 minutes I need the car here, it tells me, OK, not 20 minutes, but 23. The autonomous car will come, not my own, because why to own car? A car is idle most of the time. And again, car is a lot of steel, plastics, everything, and a lot of emissions. So let's share the cars. And big city, which is uh, uh, managed by optimization model, can actually reduce the traffic jams. Because we people are unpredictable. You know, we decide to go there. If it's optimization model, uh, the car would uh, drive a little bit slowly, uh, move there, move there to minimize those traffic jams. And uh, it would be a quite pretty big task to, to write the software for it. A lot of research, but it would help. So this is the model of a smart city where you've got many things, uh, but something is missing there. And what is missing is the industry. Because city can't uh, actually act without industry. And industry means flow of material products and flow of people. So uh, this should be a little bit uh, extended, but uh, it's a lot of development uh, which is uh, getting, uh, you can see, smart street lights. This is the most recent development. Uh, I don't know if you've got it here, but uh, we are lighting streets all the night. Why? Uh, if you've got good sensor for movement, the street lights are switched on 
when they indicate some movement, when nothing is moving, why to, why to light it? You know, and there are many, many things like this. Smart buildings, again, it's a lot of opportunities. Uh, some are introduced, some are at the moment too expensive, and it goes to energy. And the problem is that uh, smart cities will require a lot of energy. Smart city is saving some energy, but requires a lot of energy. And this is the major challenge. Well, we, we will have this I talked about. We've got uh, mobility. We can do a lot to make it energy efficient. We can do a lot about the waste, uh, as uh, waste is contributing to uh, uh, pollution a lot. You've got some figures here. Uh, we can deal with waste. This is actually from the old city, this uh, smart uh, waste bin, which is indicating, yes, I will finish, don't worry, uh, uh, which is indicating uh, when it needs to be collected because otherwise you send big lorry to collect something which is not there. Smart alarming system. You know, in, if uh, at 9-11 they've got smart alarming system, many people would be saved. Because if we look here, we've got exit, exit. But if fire is there, we would run into fire. It should be changing. It should be intelligent. Uh, well, uh, we have to do a lot, and uh, uh, what needs to be done, uh, most population will live in cities. Uh, big cities would be more and more uh, bigger, and it requires a lot of research. So there are examples of uh, green buildings. Uh, this is the list of uh, most uh, sustainable buildings. You can believe it or not. But the last thing which I would like to mention is uh, smart industry, 4.0. Germans are called it 4.0. I don't know why. It is like this. And uh, uh, there are benefits, but there are also problems. And what is the problem of smart industry are, again, environmental footprints, emissions, waste, resources. And they have to be more efficient than non-smart. Otherwise, why we should use it? Uh, so uh, we've got problem with logistics, integration to smart environment, energy circle economy. And uh, there are some many, many other things. But uh, the major, major issue is uh, uh, what has been happening. Those are example of some uh, big companies who started to implement. And each of them is doing something which is uh, highly uh, appreciated, but uh, still it needs a lot. But uh, what I like is smart agriculture. You know, uh, farmer will not be, hopefully in the future, the guy in the muddy boots coming through manure, but an operator sitting in front of uh, uh, the monitor. Uh, the cows will be monitored by drones, by microchips. Uh, uh, this will tell you they need to eat, they will need. So this is the vision of the future. But uh, the problem is energy. And uh, we've got uh, this example of those data centers. And I already mentioned it, and data centers are growing source of environmental emissions. And it will be more and more. So, because you need to leave, I will jump uh, to the end. Uh, there are many some other interesting things, but uh, we should consider this Internet of Things from two points, from benefits and profits, and from the problems. And uh, the absolutely the last thing is uh, safety and security. In the future, you don't need to bomb city. To get over the smart city, what do you need? 
you need hackers. Yeah, they either put it on standstill or they persuade the city to do what you want. And, uh, you know, generals are always preparing for the previous war. Nowadays, the most powerful army will be the army with uh, IT people, with smart IT people, because in that case, they can do everything. And we've got examples. You know, there are cyber attacks which already did very, very bad things. So, uh, that's it. <laughs>